Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan Bradley. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Campbell Property Management. I'm one of the five partners here at Campbell. I'm also a licensed CAM, and I work very closely with some of our largest HOA clients on major issues like document revisions, rules enforcement, et cetera. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with Campbell, we've been in business since 1953 and manage over 400 HOA and condo clients from Dade all the way up to St. Lucie counties here in South Florida. I'm gonna be the moderator for today's discussion on uh, enforcing your covenants. Our legal expert with us today is Andrew Black. He is an excellent condo and HOA attorney. We've had the privilege of working with him for several years now. Andrew is a member of the firm K Bender Rembaum one of Florida's leading firms specializing in the field of community association law. They are a leader in providing free education. They do webinars, periodicals, blogs, and they even have a radio show. So just a reminder, this is for informational purposes only today and not legal advice. If you need legal advice, please reach out to your association attorney. So Andrew, thank you for joining us. You wanna say anything about yourself or the firm today? Yeah, no, thank you. I'm, I'm certainly happy to you know, join you all. I want to thank Evan and obviously Ashley for organizing this. I know um, everyone's got a lot of stuff to do these days so for you all to take your time out and spend an hour with us. That's great. Um, I've been with the firm. I think I'm in my 14th year. Time flies. I'm one of the partners of the firm. I am board certified in condominium and HOA law um, by the Florida Bar. So this is really what our firm does. I would say 99% of our client base is condos, HOAs, all throughout the South Florida. Um, so yeah, I'm just excited to be here and I uh, want to thank you all for taking the time out. Great. Thanks, Andrew. So, so let's get into it. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's a big word on that first slide, covenants. What are covenants and where do these covenants and rules actually come from, Andrew? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. What are we talking about here? You know, the word covenant, if you break it down, is really just a fancy word. It means a promise. So you as an owner, whether you buy in a condo, buy in a HOA, when you go through the closing and you buy your home and that big set of governing docs is provided to you. It contains all sorts of these promises. And these promises, these covenants, they're recorded in the county. And they're called covenants to run with the land, which means they bind your property. And they're as enforceable as any contract you may ever sign. So you know, I always say if you're not sure of if you're buying a home in a condo or in an HOA and you're not sure what those covenants say, what you're promising to do, make sure you're fully aware of that before you join your uh, your community. All right. So, all right, the, someone signed up. They have this contract. There's certain rules and covenants that they have to follow. Uh, does the association have to enforce those covenants and rules? What if they don't like some of them? Right, and, and, and we, we get um, asked that a lot. And the association, you all obviously know, the board is the body that's entrusted with operating that community. And every board member, whether you're in a condominium, subject to, as I'm sure you all know, chapter 718 of the Florida Statutes, or you're a board member of an HOA subject to chapter 720 of the Florida statutes, both of those statutory chapters, they have language in there that talks about every board member has what's called a fiduciary duty to the owners. A fiduciary is another fancy word. It just means that you as a member of the board, you're in a position of trust. So every decision you make the benefit of the entire community is what your primary goal should be. And part of that fiduciary obligation is to enforce what those covenants say, what those promises are. You know, you as an owner promise not to have a commercial truck. You as an owner promise not to have a dog. The association has certain promises they need to keep as well. You promise to maintain the common area. 
But, you know, sometimes boards, I think, get bad rap sometimes. They're condo commandos. Why are they in my lives? But the bottom line is those covenants, that's a contractual obligation that they must have. And board members, pursuant to their fiduciary duty, they are entrusted to enforce those. Right. So what happens if the board doesn't enforce them? Yeah, there could be a couple of things. One is an owner could claim that the board breached that fiduciary duty that they have. And then you have a fact pattern where the covenants require, let's just use a no commercial truck example. It is not been enforced. It's been years. Now you have a lot of commercial trucks there. An owner could point and say, hey, what about Article 10 of the original governing documents say no commercial trucks? Board, you have now breached that fiduciary obligation that you owe to every owner to enforce these things, okay? And we obviously, and Evan talked about it at the top, and I'll do my quick attorney spiel here also. This is not direct legal advice for you. So obviously get with your associations attorney if you have any particular questions. But what generally happens if an owner raises or even brings a formal breach of fiduciary duty claim, a court, a judge will analyze what would a reasonably prudent member of the board done? What would he or she have done if presented with the same facts? So if there's a clear provision in your governing the, the documents that says no commercial trucks. If you don't enforce it, you risk a breach of fiduciary duty claim. And you also, just from a practical standpoint, um, you run the risk of now having lots of these violations there. And it makes it very problematic to enforce all of the governing documents if you start to make these types of exceptions. All right. So, I mean, we both, we both know these exceptions exist, uh, you know, or have existed in the past. So what happens when a new board comes in and, and they ran on a platform of we're going to clean up the community and maybe they're going to deal with some of these rules or covenants that have not been enforced? Yeah, and this is obviously a very common thing. We give lots of board member certification courses as well. And I love it when someone's never served before, they get elected, they're on the board, they read the governing documents with a fine tooth comb, which everyone should do. You become fully aware of what those covenants say. And the board decides we're gonna start sending violations out. We know we have this, obli this, this obligation to enforce these things. What could happen, and I'd like to stick with the commercial truck hy hypothetical because we deal with these sorts of things. Let's say, you know, Article 10 of your original governing document says no commercial vehicles allowed. For whatever reason, prior boards just never enforced it. And you have 10 commercial trucks there. A new board gets in power. They start to send violation notices out to those 10 owners that have had their trucks for a very long time. What those 10 owners could say, and again, this is, doesn't always happen, but you need to be made aware that this is a possible defense that could be raised, is an owner could say, board, these trucks have been here for so long, you have waived your ability to now enforce against my truck. Essentially, the owner could argue that the, that the board has sat on its hands for so long and the new board wouldn't be able to claim, well, it was the old board's fault because the enforcing party is the association, right? That corporate, that not-for-profit corporation, that's who is enforcing it. So those 10 owners using the commercial truck hypothetical, those 10 owners could assert you've waived your ability to enforce. So you might be thinking, okay, 
So now we know these 10 trucks that have been there for a very long time, those 10, we might not have the ability to do anything with, but the next new owner that brings their truck in, we're going to nail them and we're going to send the violation out. Mm -hmm. What could possibly happen is we'll call this the 11th truck, right? The 11th truck, that owner could say, hey, board, what about these other 10 trucks? You can't single me out. And that owner could, and again, it is, it's not a, it doesn't always happen, but you should be aware of this. That 11th owner could claim a selective enforcement defense, essentially stating that this board, you can't pick and choose and enforce against me. So now you might be thinking, okay, we have these 10 old trucks that we know maybe have to be there because we've waived our enforcement rights. It's been so long. We have this 11th truck that we may know might need to be kept because it's um, we can't selectively enforce it. And boards get stuck with how do we deal with this fact pattern. And there is a way to re institute a, a restriction that may have been lost due to waiver or selective enforcement. And that's called the republication process. It sounds complicated, but it's not. It's a board vote where the board decides at a meeting that says, for whatever reason, this commercial vehicle violation hasn't been enforced. We've got these 11 trucks here. We want, the board wants to approve republishing that. And then you, then you send notice to every owner that says, beginning on this day forward, we're going to begin enforcing this commercial truck. The one fly in the ointment of that is, is the 11 trucks that are there, those are allowed to stay. They're grandfathered in. That's what that term grandfathering in means. So it's not a perfect answer, but at least you kind of plug the hole. You have the 11 there but you're now able to timely enforce against all future trucks. Right. And that was a pretty common question. What, you know, how long does non-enforcement have to go on before something becomes grandfathered? Yeah. Um, you know, there's differing schools of thought out there. We always like to say that um, it's reasonable that something should be enforced within one year of when the board knew about a violation or should have known about it. So that doesn't mean every member of the board needs to have actual knowledge of something. The, um, you would analyze whether you should have known, certainly using the uh, commercial truck example, if it's been parked there, I think most reasonable people would assert that they should have known about it. I will say, a, the statute of limitations, and there's a chapter in the Florida statutes, it's chapter 95 that goes through how long people have to file a formal suit. Mm -hmm. The statute of limitations for a breach of contract is a five-year time frame. And, okay. as we, and as we talked about, the governing documents are a contractual agreement. So five years is definitely the farthest out but we certainly like to keep boards within that one year time frame. Right. That makes a lot of sense. So how now we know the association has these rules, they have a duty to enforce these rules. How do they actually go about it? Sure. And, um, you know, every community has your own spin on this. So there's a lot of you know, practical things that the board has the, you know, it's their judgment. But the first thing you definitely want to check is do your governing documents, which by the way, are unique for every community. You know, there's not one size fits all. So I would have no idea what your particular governing documents say. But a lot of times they do say if there's a violation observed, they have a notice requirement there. So you would wanna follow that. If your governing documents are silent, it's an interesting thing, maybe a lot of boards aren't aware of this, but the Florida statutes don't specifically state, here's the notice you must tell John Smith to get rid of his commercial truck. 
we do recommend that the board have a, a violation enforcement policy adopted. You want to try to stay objective. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to perhaps, you know, you want to be friendly. This is, you know, just because you're on the board, you're an owner as well. So I'm not opposed if it's not an adversarial thing, you know, the board or management or someone who's there from the association can certainly make a initial, maybe friendly verbal request. You know, look, if someone's leaving their trash cans out for too long, I don't think you need to slap them with a formal violation notice as the first thing. So you want to try to be reasonable with that. But if those amicable attempts don't work, you absolutely want to send a written notice. You want to send it to that owner that clearly identifies what the violation is. And you want to provide a date certain for how long they have to cure that. Um, right. Some boards send one, some send two, you know, but you, you, you want to definitely document it, what the violations are. Right. right. And this is where management can help a lot. I mean, there's a lot of technology now uh, that's gotten very good at managing violations. We've developed a lot of best practices on how, you know, what violations should, uh, you know, how much time you should give to cure different violations. And those things, like you said, are kind of up to the discretion of the board. Uh, and that's an area where we can help you. So um, let's assume you, you have a policy and you've sent the right notices uh, it's not being responded to. Uh, what do you do? Yeah. And you have a couple available enforcement options. I always joke, there's no magical dust you can sprinkle on them. So, you know, there, there isn't, it, you know, some, some owners and we all have dealt with them. They just won't, you know, they just won't do what needs to be done. So one of the options, and we're going to get into it. One of the options is the fining process. Mm -hmm. And for both condos and for HOAs, where um, your governing documents, whether you're in, you're in a condo or an HOA, they do not need to specifically authorize fining because mm -hmm. Chapter 718 for condos and Chapter 720 for HOAs both have that fining authority. And before we get into the exact process, it's important to note that fining is a deterrent. It does not cure the underlying violation. The goal is that it will, you know, no one likes to pay, you know, a sum, but it is important to keep that in the back of your mind. Fining doesn't cure the underlying violation. Now, for fining, the process and it's very similar, almost identical for condos and HOAs. Both of those um, chapters of the Florida statutes requires the board to establish an independent committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it needs to be at least three. I mean, three is the most common number we see. Could it be five? Sure. Could it be seven? Sure. But I think three is the most common. We always like it's an odd, odd, obviously that way, if there's a two to one vote, it still gets approved. If you have an even number, you may be left with a split vote, mm -hmm. but that committee needs to be independent, which means it, it can't be a member of the board. It can't be an officer. It can't be an association employee. And it can't be the spouse, parent, or child of those board members, officers, or employees. So truly independent. And the board is the body that has the authority to um, appoint those. So the first step is to have a meeting of your board, 48 hours notice posted. The agenda item could simply read, you know, creation of you know, finding committee, some places call it a, a uh, grievance. It doesn't really matter which word you actually use, but you want to make sure there's minutes of a board meeting that reflect that this committee was established. So that's step one. Once the committee's established, in order to find, you do need to pr provide a 14-day notice. 
You have to mail it to the owner. If the tenant is the one being fined, you need to mail it to the tenant as well. And that 14 day notice will give the date, time and location for the hearing that the will be before the actual independent committee. So there needs to be a committee hearing and you want to think of it like a mini, you know, due process trial where someone from the association is essentially in the role of like the prosecuting attorney. The defendant is the owner. Um, whatever proof of the violation, if it's a commercial truck, a photo of it, you know, and then it's the independent committee's job. They're the body that either confirms or rejects that fine and it's not their role it's not the committee's role to you know reduce a fine or to enter into some sort of other agreement that they think is fair it's really the committee's job it's either a thumbs up or a thumbs down this is the fine amount that the board's approved and it's that uh committee's role to either approve it or not Right. Yeah, I think that's a really important distinction. I think some committees take on a little bit more responsibility than they're really allowed under under the statute. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, some HOAs, at, you know, have in their documents the the right to cure. Um, what authority do they have to actually fix a violation themselves rather than try to go through this fining process? Sure. You mean the actual condo or the homeowners association? Yeah. 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 So. Evan's talking about a concept. It's it's uh, we use the phrase self help, which is where um, an owner. Um, it's common if they didn't maintain their lot. Let's just say, and there's a bunch of trash and an old bed thrown out on the front lawn, and you know boards don't want to see that, and owners complain about that. And the authority to to actually access an owner's property. To cure that by the to cure it, um, that does need to be in your. It, it's a document specific thing, meaning your unique set of governing documents needs to have that authority. Obviously, if it's a bona fide emergency, then certainly um, you know the board needs to be able to take reasonable action there. But to cure the most common one, as I said, is someone didn't you know repair something or someone didn't throw something away. Um, the governing documents do need to provide authority for uh, that. Gotcha. Thanks. So a couple of people in the chat were asking who, who levies the fine? Is it the board and then the grievance committee hears it? Or does the committee levy the fine and the board upholds it? Uh, there's some confusion about that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure most of you have read the Florida statutes in some form. And we have um, several attorneys in our office that tried to assist these legislators in drafting statutory language to make sure it makes sense. Unfortunately, the current finding language is not, as I put it, not as artfully drafted as we would like to see. That's a good way to spin that. Sure. Our view is, is that the board levies the fine, right? The board says, John Smith, you're being fine. And I should mention, some of you know this, I'm sure, but a fine can be up to $100 per day with a $1,000 maximum cap for a uh, continuing thing. For HOAs only, if the governing documents of the HOA say that a fine can be in a different amount, more than that $1,000 or more than that $100, the HOA documents can authorize that. But if the documents are silent for both HOAs and condos, it's hundred bucks a day, thousand dollars max. But the board is the one that approves this is the fine. The fine isn't final until that committee hearing takes place. And the language that the statute uses is the committee either confirms the fine or rejects it. So the board levies it the committee confirms or rejects it. So the board can't then get, let's say your committee rejects it. The board can't just overrule them and say, well, we don't care what that independent committee says. We're still gonna, you know, 
add that fine to the owner's account, that would be um, improper and not what the statute calls for. Thanks for clarifying that. So now, you know, we find this individual, well, we enforced our rules. Now we, we find the individual. Uh, maybe it's something we can't cure on our own. We don't have that in our docs. I mean, do we have any other remedies here? I mean, we still have a violation, right? Yes. Yep. And um, another enforcement right, which I like this slide that Jim looks awesome up there, um, is you can suspend use rights. Okay. And suspension of use rights can be done in two fact patterns. The first one, it's the same process for a fine. That's when there's a violation. So I'll use the commercial truck example. The board can fine them using the process I just talked about, or they can suspend their use rights for that commercial truck. And it's the same process, meaning the board approves the initial taking away whatever their use rights are. The minutes of the board meeting reflect that. And then the 14 day notice needs to be sent to the owner. If there's a tenant involved, it's sent to the tenant as well. And there, that 14 day notice will have the date, time and location of when that independent committee will meet. And it's the same process, that independent committee, they either confirm or reject it. And it's important to note use rights, um, practically, I'm sure Evan from a management perspective can speak on this as well. Use rights, taking them away, practically only really works if you have like electronic fob access, something that you can deactivate. Yeah. The things that are most common, the gym, the clubhouse, the swimming pool, what mm -hmm. you cannot suspend is the ability of an owner to park their car. You obviously can't suspend any area of the property that they need to get to their actual home. You can't suspend, you know, utility services, turning off their water or something like those life safety things. So it really applies to clubhouse, gym, pool, and again, practically, really when you can deactivate. Yeah, yeah. from a management's yeah. perspective, it's, it's almost unenforceable, and, and you're asking for potential physical confrontations if you start to try to remove people from an area that they can access. If there's not a fob access or a barcode or something to be turned off, uh, you're going to have an extremely difficult time. And uh, we would always advise against trying to have board members or, or management employees try to, you know, remove people from an area of the common elements. It's you're asking for, for trouble for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I should also mention that use right um, taking away someone's use rights for a violation. It the way the statute reads, it needs to be for a reasonable period of time. I always like to point that out. There's no specific guidance on how long that is. Is 10 days reasonable? Is 30? Is 45? I'll leave that to the board to use as business judgment. Um, is two months reasonable? Um, so, you know, it's not a permanent thing. It, it's for a reasonable period of time. Um, one other thing on this topic is the statutes for both HOAs and condos mm -hmm. also authorize suspending use rights if an owner is um, past due, 90, if they're 90 days past due, mm -hmm. the board can suspend their common area rights to the gym, clubhouse pool. The difference with suspension for a 90 day past due is there's no committee involved. It's just the association accounting records reflect that John Smith has a balance more than, more than three months old. The board does need to have, um, they need to notice, they need to vote on it. So a board meeting must still happen. The board approves the, you know, taking away their use rights because of the 90 days. And then you must send written notice to that owner that says, 
the association records reflected in more than 90 days past due at a board meeting on whatever date, the board voted to approve suspending the following rights. And that ends when the owner brings his account current. So if the owner pays in full, those use rights should be immediately reinstated. Gotcha. So a, a popular question, both in advance of this presentation and in the chat here, is uh, suspension of non-essential utilities. Some of the new, uh, newer cable services in particular will give you the ability to turn off individual cable to units. Uh, and now a lot of associations are bundling internet uh, as part of the service. How do you feel about that? Yeah, there's different schools of thought. So again, get with your association's attorney. There isn't any binding case law that we're aware of. What I typically say is if your bulk provider, some of them don't even have the ability to do that. So that's step one. But Evan, you're absolutely right. Some do. They say we do have the ability to target a specific home. As long as those bulk services aren't connected to like a life safety thing, as long as their phone isn't involved because you want to make sure someone can make an outgoing call so they can call 911, um, as long as it's not connected to like a life safety thing, I've never seen, and I shouldn't say that, I, I, I would be very surprised if an owner who is more than 90 days past due incurs the time and expense to file a formal challenge to say you improperly turned off my cable when the association could immediately turn it right back on. So by the time it really got to any sort of formal challenge, I think there's not a whole lot of real risk there. Um, you know, so it's really up to each board, you know, how aggressive they want to be there. Right. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on the uh, on the cable for sure. I think boards need to be very careful about turning off internet. Uh, so many things are now connected to the internet uh, that may have a you know a life safety function. Uh, exactly. You need to be much more careful when looking at internet versus uh, cable. But uh, for sure, consult your own attorney on that one. So now we find we've suspended uh, Mr. or Mrs. Jones from the gym and the pool. And uh, we had no resolution, Andrew. What are we, now what are we going to do? Yeah, and we, we really talked about a, a, a common issue for our board member clients is we went through the finding process. Maybe John Smith has lots of funds. He just writes a check and his commercial truck is still there. Maybe John Smith hasn't been to a gym a day in his life. He could care less that his rights have been turned off for that. So what can we do? Under the law, the options really are left with taking formal legal action against that owner. And I should start off by saying that's never the desire of a board. You know, my role at the firm is we have an entire litigation department. They're the most aggressive attorneys I've met. And when the time comes, will go full force. But my job is more on the general association matters. I like to keep clients out of trouble. And if, it's, if there's a way to resolve it short of filing formal action, that's certainly the preferred approach. But we all know that doesn't always happen. This process is slightly different for an HOA and a condominium. In an HOA, you do the standard violation process. That doesn't work. And Evan just put up there. You have a pre-suit, you have a mediation process where there's a neutral third party. Oftentimes that third party is an attorney, but it's a neutral process where the goal of that is to see if the sides can come up to some agreement. Now, you do need to still send a demand to the owner that says, look, before we file a lawsuit, this mediation process has to happen. Um, and those mediation costs are split between the association and the owner. Again, that neutral third party sees if there can be some agreement. 
If it is wonderful that agreements reduce to a, um, you know, each party signs off on it and the matters resolve. What happens a lot of times is what's called an impasse is reached. That neutral third party can't resolve it. And when that fails, then the association is authorized under the law to file a lawsuit in state court against that homeowner. Obviously, this whole formal dispute resolution process, this is handled by your attorney. But it's important just to know that this formal legal action process is available. So when that pre-suit process fails, you're authorized, your association is authorized to file a lawsuit in state court. And then at that point, um, obviously the complaint is served, the owner has 20 days to answer. It depends on what filings are made, but the goal is to get either a settlement agreement in terms that are favorable to the board, or if that doesn't happen, obviously to get a court order instructing the owner to take care of what's wrong. So that's in the HOA realm. Um, Andrew, that all sounds a little bit expensive. Who's going to pay for all these attorney's fees? Yeah, no, we, we say, um, you know, uh, principles can be expensive, right? So boards sometimes want to say it's just wrong. Well, that can add up fees quick, obviously. The attorney's fees in the pre-suit process, the, the, those fees are shared, but if that pre-suit attempt fails and a lawsuit's filed, mm -hmm. the prevailing party, the party who wins, is the party that's able to recover its fees from the other side. So certainly there's a risk for the HOA if there's not significant evidence of the violations if you don't have people with firsthand knowledge who observed it, who are willing to sign affidavits or to testify in court, and you really need to build a case when you're getting to that lawsuit process, there is some risk because if the association does not prevail, the owner will uh, is entitled to get his or her fees from the HOA. Yeah, and what I always tell our boards is litigation is a business decision. It is not about right and wrong. It's not about principle. It's a business decision. It's the cost benefit there uh, because it's never, never a sure thing. I mean, you got to be confident in your case, review the whole file, you know, understand any weaknesses you have before you enter down this road because you may get too far down it before you realize you weren't as uh, on sure footing as maybe you thought you were. Um, and then there's some unintended consequences. I mean, if you go to court and you lose, you know, what message is that sending to other owners too? You got to yeah, you know, think for about sure. all that. And word, you can bet word will get out quick that John Smith won and it's just going to create a uh, whole set of, uh, of issues that the board doesn't deal with. And oftentimes owners, they don't need to hire their own attorney. They could be what's called pro se. They could just represent themselves. And if you've ever had the, you know, fact pattern where you've dealt with a pro se owner filing various claims in court, that can be a whole headache as well. So, yep, I share those thoughts. Yep. Yeah, litigation is not uh, an automatic cure-all for sure. So we, uh, we had a bunch of uh, questions that got submitted in advance. Uh, some of them fit into our presentation and sure. some of them didn't. So let's go through a few of the ones that, that maybe didn't quite fit in earlier. Uh, one of them was, what do you do if you have no, no one will volunteer for your grievance or fine committee? Uh, what, what can you do? Can you not fine? Do you do nothing? Yeah. I mean, that's obviously tough. Sometimes communities have a hard enough time finding people to serve on a board. So then to get people to step up and serve, the statute does require a independent committee in order to find. So if you don't have people willing to do that, and you can certainly try very persuasive things. You want to really plead that you need them to step up for the good of everyone. But if all of those attempts fail, then um, if the board tries to find without that independent committee, 
an owner would have the ability to challenge that. And I would rather be the attorney for the owner in that fact pattern when it's clear that the association didn't follow that independent committee process. So if you can't find, then you need to think about the um, other enforcement route, which is going through the formal legal action process. Right. So they don't have to find to go to pre-suit mediation. You could go straight to pre-suit mediation. Yeah, exactly. And I should also mention for condominiums, the formal legal action process is slightly different than HOAs. There's, I'm sure you all have heard, there's the Division of Florida Condominiums. That's the state agency that regulates uh, condominiums. And they have a whole arbitration department. So formal legal action for condominiums, rather than filing a lawsuit in state court, almost all condominium um, problems that can't get resolved, the formal legal action goes through arbitration. It's very similar to filing a lawsuit in state court rather than filing a complaint. The association files a petition for our petition for arbitration. The arbitrator serves the same rule as a judge and you can get a final order from an arbitrator. So I just wanted to touch base on that. Okay. So this one came up a few different times. How do you find your members without ruining your standing in the community? I mean, board members are, um, they live in the community too. And this is kind of a practical one. I'll, I'll take this, Andrew, because sure. Um, a lot of this is about process. It's about having, you know, the policy set up in advance, like you talked about. It's about, you know, understanding what are the best practices when you're going to be enforcing these violations. You got to enforce them uniformly. If it appears as though you're selectively enforcing, you're going to look a lot worse in the eyes of the community than if it's obvious that everyone's getting, you know, similar violations for similar issues. Um, this is where you can put the burden of enforcement on your management company. You know, the board shouldn't, I never recommend the board be out doing a violation tour themselves. Re you know, remove yourself one step from the process, let your licensed manager do that tour and, and mark down those violations for you. Um, you know, if you're going to enforce violations that haven't been enforced in the past, you know, like you said, first they got to be republished. And then I even recommend giving them a warning that not only have they been republished, but now we're really going to do this and your roof is in violation or your driveway and you have 30 days. Um, but after that, there's going to be real violations. I think people will find that to be much more fair than just hitting them with a, with a violation right out of the box. And uh, I've even seen some properties uh, when they have a, a roof cleaner or tree trimmer coming on property for association business, they know they're licensed and insured saying this person's going to be here. And I've even seen them negotiate a, a bulk discount. So that there's really no excuse to not have your roof clean when there's a reputable vendor who's going to come on property and give you a discounted price. After that, if you get a violation, I mean, it's not really, you know, you did everything you could at that point. So uh, that, that's what we see practically. Andrew, do you have anything to, to add there? Yeah, I mean, look, I always say from the attorney side of things, you know, board members know their owners better than we do. So mm -hmm. There is a certain level of just f fairness and, and, and trying to communicate in advance, just like Evan said, and your property manager and your management company should handle a lot of that. So no owner can claim with any merit that they weren't aware that this is what the process is. And if you really communicate a lot, what I've seen is other owners will start calling out the one owner who says, I was never told of this. Those other owners will say, hey, I've gotten 17 things in the last two months about this. So it does shift the burden to that one or two non-compliant owners. All right. So this next one is, uh, how do we enforce ARC violations or architectural requests for change? Uh, are those, How are those enforceable, Andrew? Yeah, sure. I mean, these are very much document specific as far as what the exact requirements are. And one of the first slides Evan put up is know what the rules are. I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with boards that say, I know we have a rule that says this. And I look in their docs and I have to, as charmingly as I can say, 
well, I don't see that rule. Do you have a copy of something I'm not aware of? And oftentimes it's not there. It's this urban legend that's been passed down from boards to boards. So the first thing is know exactly what the architectural requirements actually are. Make sure your governing documents have some authority for the boards to even involve themselves with it and make sure whatever ARC application that you have actually match what the governing documents say. I've seen governing documents that give the architectural committee, sometimes it's just the board. I see it gives them 45 days to approve it or not. And then I see the application and it gives them 30 days, you know, things like that. You want to make sure that it's, you know, you're telling owners exactly what your documents require, but you enforce it in the same way you enforce any other violation. You know, you want to send notice to that owner. Suspension and fining is definitely an enforcement right. Lots of governing documents, and again, I wouldn't know what they say, but lots of governing documents have some level of what's called self-help, which I talked about, you know, earlier that may give the board the authority to cure an, uh, some ARC problem. Obviously, that's a pretty extensive process, and, and it's, not, um, it's not to be done on a knee-jerk board vote. I mean, you really need to evaluate what that would entail. But we certainly have filed lots of lawsuits and lots of arbitration actions, getting orders compelling an owner to fix what they did wrong as far as ARC alterations. All right. And from a practical standpoint, you know, from our point of view, you, you want to have those ARC applications, you know, have a running list of what's open, what's closed, what's been submitted with management. And it, it needs to be a focus of your violation tour. It should be something that the manager brings with them when they're out on property. Uh, just be, don't assume that just because someone submitted an application and it got approved that their contractor is going to do exactly what was on that application. Uh, we see people cheat all the time. You know, they want a little bit of a bigger fenced in area. So they get approved and now they bump the fence out or they change the plant material at the last minute maybe because it was cheaper, maybe because they, they were worried about getting something approved. So you want to inspect these projects while they're open and ongoing. Um, so to Andrew's point, you can see the violation when it's happening, not two years later, and you're going to have trouble enforcing it possibly. Um, you know, you, you really need to be on top of this stuff as it's happening. Otherwise, it can get away from you. So the last one, and this I hear this all the time. How do we evict a renter who's constantly <laughs> violating our rules, Andrew? How do we get them the heck um, out of here? I know. And that's the one where, you know, I think I always tell boards, you have to manage your expectations a little bit on what the process is. The first thing I always encourage boards to check is do your governing documents have language in them that allows the association to what I call step into the shoes of the owner as the landlord and to terminate a lease and evict a tenant on behalf of the owner. That stand in the shoes authority, I think is a very important one and it strengthens the association's case where they can move for a more of a summary or a quicker eviction process because you have to remember there's a landlord tenant statute out there. It's chapter 83, which says for just a normal landlord, if your tenant is violating something, you need to give them like a seven day notice to cure. And then if they don't, you can then maybe file for eviction, it would be better in our view if your documents allow the association to step into the shoes of that owner and move for eviction. If you don't have that step into the shoes language, oftentimes you would have to sue the owner to compel the owner to get rid of whatever that problem tenant is. That's one option. That could be a bit, you know, a, a more drawn out process. Um, one thing I always like to point out is if you have a lease approval process and it's clear that lease renewals are required to be approved as well, we always think it's a good idea to clarify that. If the tenants only has a couple months left, in my view, it's a little bit easier 
to disapprove the lease renewal request, tell the owner based on the tenant's documented inability to follow the following 10 rules and you have prior violations you sent, you're dealing with these things when they actually happen, you can inform the owner that the lease renewal request will be rejected. And I've seen that work um, a bit smoother. Um, I will say, and we, you all, Campbell, and our firm's done lots of good COVID courses. So I don't want to get into that world right now, but certainly judges are human beings as well. And they can be somewhat reluctant, especially in this climate, to uh, force someone from their home, you know, without real significant evidence of violations, people willing to testify, sign affidavits. It's in my mind, never quite enough to say, well, the tenant was being a jerk. I always say being a jerk isn't a legal violation, right? You know, the tenant was being a jerk. The tenant, you know, had a glass bottle at the pool. You have to imagine if the owner or the tenant challenges that eviction or that removal, you have to imagine that a judge is viewing these things. They don't have any preconceived notions of who this tenant is. And if the only evidence that the association has, you have to imagine you're the judge, that there's a glass bottle by the pool, or they were, you know, kind of a jerk to the manager, that's likely not going to be enough to force someone out. So my suggestion is build a case as much as you can. Check your documents if you have that stand in shoes language where the association can just move for a more of a, of a direct eviction and check the lease expiration date because it perhaps would be easier just to deny a request to renew that. All right. And this one came up uh, quite a bit in the chat too. And it's if you they've levied the fine and the owner refuses to pay, how do you actually get paid on a fine? Great question. And I was a bit remiss not to highlight this earlier for condos and HOAs. There's a little bit, um, they're not the exact same. The first thing is for both condos and HOAs, if the committee approves the fine, you do need to send notice to that owner that the fine amount has been adopted. For condos, chapter 718 does not allow a fine to be a lien against that condominium. So you can't do the standard collection and foreclosure process in condominiums for a fine. So what does that mean? It's still added to the condo owner's account. It's still there. And if it's more than 90 days past due, you can take away their ability to use the gym. Also, when that owner ever goes to sell, usually the title companies is the one that uh, requests what's called an estoppel. Mm -hmm. which is just a fancy word for showing what monies are owed on that account. And you would list that fine and you'd get that fine at closing when the condo unit is sold. You could file a small claims action to collect that fine. In my experience, most associations really don't want to incur the time and expense to file a small claims lawsuit over a thousand bucks. And most of the time, it just stays on that owner's account. For HOAs, the same thought press, the same thought process. It, it'll be on that owner's account. You could get it at closing if it's more than ninety days past due. You can take away their right. But for HOAs, fines of a thousand dollars or more, because remember, HOA governing documents could authorize fines in excess of a thousand dollars. Fines of thousand dollars or more can be a lien. And you could um, go through the formal collection foreclosure process on that HOA fine in the same way you would if the owner didn't pay their regular, you know, quarterly dues. So for HOAs, um, you do have the, 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 um, the ability for $1,000 or more to go through that lien and foreclosure process. Yeah, in our experience, collecting it at closing is, is usually the most effective way. It may take more yeah. time, uh, but you typically do get it. So, all right. Well, we're right up here against one o'clock. Uh, 
I, I do see we had a lot of questions left in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, this is a pretty complicated topic and a lot of the answers to a lot of those questions are gonna be very specific to uh, your individual circumstance or your community. So sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, we will be doing more webinars. And if you need help in your community, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, uh, Campbell Property Management for uh, practical you know, operational matters. And if you need legal advice on these topics, uh, please reach out to Andrew and uh, Kay Bender-Rembaum. So thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you very much, Andrew, for your time and expertise. Thank you. Uh, hopefully this is all a little more clear for the board members in attendance. Uh, we have a lot of CAMs in attendance today. Uh, please stay on. Uh, when Ashley ends the uh, webinar, you'll be redirected to an evaluation page. There are CEU credits for today's course. You will need to fill out that evaluation page to get those credits. So thanks everyone again. Hopefully you're able to learn a few things. Uh, this is complicated and extensive. Uh, there's a lot of practical uh, advice and legal advice necessary. Uh, so please contact your management companies and attorneys before you go too far down this road of maybe changing your process or instituting a process or uh, especially before maybe taking something to court. So uh, we did put up some poll questions. We'd appreciate answers to those. Uh, those will help us make these future webinars better. And uh, by default, by registering for our webinar, you have been registered for our blog and newsletter. Uh, so please look for that and there will be emails about future webinars. So that's about it for me today. Andrew, anything to add? No, I want to thank you and Ashley and the whole team. Thank everyone that took the time out of their day and hope to see you all soon. Great. Thanks again. And uh, thank you, board members. Have a great day.